Today's scripture reading comes from Jeremiah 1, verses 4 through 12. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Alas, sovereign God, I said, I do not know how to speak. I am too young. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am too young. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, I have put my words into your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you see, Jeremiah? I see a branch of an almond tree, I replied. The Lord said to me, you have seen correctly, for I am watching to see that my word is fulfilled. When I was probably uh, Bryn's age, grade school aged, I like to make things out of cardboard. Love doing it. I had toys, but I had more fun making things out of cardboard. I'm sure you've probably experienced this at Christmas time where the kids have more fun with the box than what was in the box. My dad ran a gas station up in Jamestown for a while and that provided me with a lot of boxes, especially the ones that cans of soda and stuff would come in. And then on my mom's side, she sold baskets for a while through a company called Baskets Plus over in Boise. I don't know if Baskets Plus was over here or not, but that provided me with a lot of cardboard as well, especially the really big boxes. Now, being a young boy with a big imagination, sometimes too big, I used all that cardboard to do everything from making forts to rolling down hills in them. Maybe that's what happened to me. I rolled down too many hills in a box. <laughs> However, the board games that I made out of those cardboard is what I think about the most. I would make board games out of that cardboard and make up the rules the whole nine yards. And then uh, my parents were gracious enough to play the games with me and my younger sister didn't really have a choice. She had to. Now, I don't remember the game that I had made, but I do remember what one of my parents had suggested to me. I was spending my summers at the time with them in California, and it was suggested that I send my homemade game into a company as a prototype with the hopes of them liking it, manufacturing it, and selling it. What an amazing thing to tell a kid to cultivate their imagination. It was pretty exciting. And I had a lot of ideas back then. Unfortunately, though, that's about as far as I took it. I never did take the advice and mail that game in, or any other for that matter. Who knows what could have been had I had the confidence to send that in. Not having the confidence to follow up on something wasn't the case for a girl by the name of uh, young Alexandra Scott was her name. Now, Alexandra Scott was less than a year old when she was diagnosed with cancer and spent her first few years of life fighting against the odds. After receiving a stem cell transplant around her fourth birthday, she vowed to start a lemonade stand to raise money for other children going through the same thing. I know a little something about lemonade stand because Bryn's been raking it in at her own lemonade stand lately. Pretty high prices, though. <laughs> well, Alexandra, with the help of her brother, that first lemonade stand raised $2,000. The lemonade stand to support cancer research became an annual thing for her family, and she raised over $1 million before losing her battle in 2004 at eight years old. 
Her family continues to carry on her legacy through Alex's Lemonade Stand Foundation. And it's raised over $150 million to date in hopes of finding a cure. And you can check out that organization at Alex, alexslemonade.org if you're interested. All that money and people helped because a four-year-old decided to use what she had to make a difference. The prophet Jeremiah was out to make a difference too in the southern kingdom of Judah around 627 to 586 BC. The nation was sliding quickly towards destruction. In the end, Jeremiah ministered under Judah's last five kings, but he very easily could not have. Had he been like young Travis in his cardboard game, he may not have done anything. He may have listened to that voice of doubt telling him he was not up to it, or he was too busy, or he had other things going on. Can you think of times in your life where you felt a calling to do something, but you didn't? Can you think of a time where you felt a nudge, but didn't act because you didn't feel like you were up for it, made for it, or the right person for the job? Jeremiah starts in verse 4, where it says, The word of the Lord came to me, saying... Now, how do you typically listen? How do you typically listen? And how do you typically hear something that's said to you? Active listening is a skill that I teach the residents I work with at my prison job. In addition, what seems like a remedial skill to some actually is not done by many. Many people actually do not actively listen. I'm sure there's some spouses that know that all too well. One definition for active listening is an active way of hearing what the other person is saying to you. In other words, making eye contact, nodding your head and otherwise acknowledging or showing that you are listening. Jeremiah says here, the word of the Lord. Eye contact isn't always an option, except for when the Lord is coming to us through other people. How else can we actively listen to the Lord? How often do you stop and smell the roses? Let us take the time to notice the Lord's work around us. Where do you see the Lord at work around you? When you woke up today, what good have you experienced? On your way to church today, what good did you experience? What did you see? What did you smell? What did you hear? What ways, when you leave here today, will you experience the goodness of God around you? The good things that he's doing. For me to notice more, and especially hear more, I need quiet. And we all have different ways that we learn and process. And for me, at least, I need all the exterior noises to be quiet in order for me to hear and process what I'm supposed to hear and process. And our lives are filled with so much busyness that we can miss things. Have you ever felt or noticed that internal nudge to say or do something? Maybe you randomly think of someone that you know or that you love. You may suddenly think, you know, I should contact so-and-so and see how they're doing. And it's just a brief passing thought. Very brief. But then you don't. You get busy. You get distracted. You go on about your day. And shortly thereafter, you find out something did go on with that person. 
Have you experienced that? That still, small voice is just that. It's often not a loud, startling bang. Therefore, in order to hear it, we need to be listening. Moreover, for many, in order to listen, we must quiet our minds that are often cluttered with the constant barrage of activity or various other distractions, social media, or otherwise focusing on things other than God. Are there things in your life that are distracting you from God? The more we don't have our focus on God, the less prone we are to both hear his word and act on it. And when we're not acting on God's word or God's directive, then we're acting on our own. And I can name a billion times where we acted on our own accord and things didn't go too well. Moving on to verse 5. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. How many of you have children? Lindsay, you better raise your hand. Do you remember a time before your children were born when you had many ideas, plans, or hopes and dreams for your eventual children? Then your kids were born. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. That is how it is, isn't it? There's just something so familiar to your children as they are growing up from a young age that's so familiar to us. We see things in them that we know somehow so well. We know it so well because they are made from us. They have things pass from us to them. Not all of them good. We know them so well because they are a version of us. And whose children are God's? Do you think he knows us? Before you were born, I set you apart. God made you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and you, with a plan in mind. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. When I read that, that appointment from God, it tells me we have a duty to be a prophet to the nations. It tells me that we have that duty. Now you may be thinking, I'm not built for that. Or I don't have skills for that. Before I formed you, I knew you. We're not alone in feeling unqualified to be a prophet to the nations. Jeremiah says in verse 6, Alas, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I am too young. I remember way back when I was in high school, we had elective classes that we could sign up for, and sometimes you got them, and sometimes you didn't. Sometimes you got stuck with other things. I don't remember signing up for speech class, but I'm sure glad I got it. Can you think of people who have felt unqualified to do something? Yet when they did, they somehow found the strength. Think of young Alexandra Scott. Do you think she felt qualified to accomplish all she did? This little girl accomplishing so much? In verse 7, but the Lord said to me, Do not say I am too young. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. I wasn't confident enough or had enough focus to send in my cardboard game that I made. But young Alexandra 
was to do all that she did. Where do those people find the strength? Where can we find the confidence to step out and do what those nudges tell us to do when we may feel some trepidation or busyness or unfocus? God. God is where we should put our faith. When we put our faith in God, He gives us that strength, that confidence to fight off the devil that's telling us that we aren't good enough or we don't have enough ability to bring God to others. Do not say, I am too young. You must go, Scripture says. Say whatever God commands us. Nevertheless, what will people say? That's what we think. What will people say, though? How will others view me? What if I mess up? What if I'm not good enough? Verse 8, do not be afraid of them, for I am with you. For I am with you. And will rescue you, declares the Lord. How qualified did Moses feel to do what God was telling him to do? How qualified do you feel? What did Moses accomplish? What will you? Do you have faith in God? If we have faith in God, knowing that He is with us always, we can move mountains. Who can stop us? If we have faith in God and knowing that He is always with us, who can stop us? And who or what can get in our way if we are following God's call for us. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. Verse 9, Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, I have put my words in your mouth. The Lord gave Jeremiah what he needed. And history is jam-packed with others that God provided all they needed to follow their calling. And the same is true for each one of us. Have you felt nudges to do something? Do you feel nudges or suddenly think of someone that you want to help or reach out to, but something has stopped you thinking, what will they think? Or I'm too busy, or I'm just not confident enough, or I don't want to spend the money for that. I don't want to risk it. Stop Stopping. Stop stopping. Don't let our human lack of confidence stop us from fulfilling what God has in mind for us. He will give you what you need to fulfill His will for your life. He will give you what you need to fulfill His will for your life. Verses 10 through 12. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. What is God nudging you to do? What has been your experience when you missed his calls? Goes on. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you see, Jeremiah? I see the branch of an almond tree. He replied, The Lord said to me, You have seen correctly, for I am watching to see that my word is fulfilled. What is God waiting for you to do today? God is watching. He's here with us now. Know that your phone is ringing. 
And it's the Lord calling you. Calling to see that his word is fulfilled. Are you listening? Don't miss his call. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we, you know that life can be so difficult for us. And in the midst of that difficultness, we, we mean well, we try well, and we, we want to do better. Lord, we ask for your strength and your wisdom, your guidance to not find excuses, to not find reasons, to not listen to your calling for us to act. Lord, we, we know that you are not overbearing when you are reaching out to us to do something, you come to us in that still, small voice. Lord, we ask for your guidance and wisdom to listen and to go beyond listening, to act upon those nudges that you are sending each and every one of us. Lord, we ask for the guidance and wisdom and strength to step out, to be bold, to make those calls, to reach out, to check on those people that are hurting, to help those that are hurting, to lend our ear to those that need it. Whether it's a shoulder to cry on, ears to listen, or just being present in their lives. Whether it's our resources that can be used to help others, or just our mere presence. Lord, we ask that we are there for other people to show our Jesus-like characteristics to others. Lord, you've provided the perfect model for us, and we strive to be more like you each and every day. God, help us to move beyond the comforts of our own lives in order to touch others with your love. In your name we pray. Amen.